All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start. Um, regards from Brooklyn, regards from Jerusalem, I want to welcome you all to the beginning of this amazing day of learning of the SCA and Tanakh study. I'm really excited to be presenting. Um, so let's get straight into it. Uh, the topic for today is freedom, Egypt, and the land of Israel, or Eretz Yisrael. And what I'd like to do in this, uh, in this short presentation is to take a look at Eretz Yisrael, the way it's presented uh, to Avraham Avinu, and the way it's introduced as a concept, which later on becomes a value as an inheritance, as a Yerusha, as something which we are intrinsically connected to. Because it's, it's such a relevant thing today when we're coming up to uh, Yom Atzmaut and Yom Yerushalayim, when we were finally able to reconnect with Eretz Yisrael after about 2,000 years of not being a sovereign nation. And when we are uh, coming into Eretz Yisrael, there are so many different ways to approach it. You can look at it from a religious perspective. You can look at it from a nationalist perspective. And how do we create a common grounds to have a conversation inside Am Yisrael about what is the value of Eretz Yisrael? And so I think that presenting it the way it is in the Torah without uh, adding on to it layers and layers, just like what's the bare bones? What is Eretz Yisrael about? I think that has the potential of creating a meaningful dialogue and conversation and also to help us in our personal lives connect to it on a deeper level. So let's get started. Um, first of all, the big idea that we have here is comparing Eretz Yisrael and Eretz Mitzrayim in a very fundamental way. Our, our nation was formed under the experience of the Shi'abud, of the slavery in Egypt. And we came into Eretz Yisrael as B'nai Chorin, as free people, as a result of that. And so there's a fundamental connection between Yitziat Mitzrayim, which we mention frequently in our prayers and so on, and Eretz Yisrael. We need to see the two uh, alongside each other. So I would like to present, first of all, um, Eretz Mitzrayim. And I want to point out that the most important landmark in, in Egypt, uh, which is it's the Nile River, of course, is going to be very, very important for understanding this difference between Eretz Yisrael and Eretz Mitzrayim and how we become B'nai Chorin and free people and what that has to do with the essence of Eretz Yisrael. So then there's, of course, Eretz Yisrael, which is, as the Pasuk we will see, says Eretz Harimu Bekaot. It's a place of valleys and mountains in which there's rainwater as opposed to the Nile. So the big idea is to compare the Nile as the water source of Egypt and rain as the, and the aquifer and so on as the water source of Eretz Yisrael and to see how those play into uh, freedom and slavery. So let's, so let's move on into Egypt, okay? So before we come into Eretz Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu gives us sort of a gloss of what we should expect when we come in. And this is the psukim that precede the, uh, the part of the Shema that we say, Ayayim Shamoa, et cetera, which we'll get into a little bit for, uh, later. So when we come into Eretz Yisrael, you see Mitzrayim is green and Eretz Yisrael is blue. And I'm doing that throughout. So Eretz Mitzrayim here is presented in, in the sense of uh, the way the Nile works, the way it impacts uh, the society there, which is a very agricultural society. And when we come into Eretz Yisrael, Lerishta, um, which is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham Avinu, we are told, It is not like Eretz Mitzrayim, which you just left. It's a kind of place where you make, uh, you sort of take the Nile and you make these canals and you drag the water into your field and then you have your vegetable garden. Now that is a very, very important uh, uh, way of doing agriculture, which is very, very different than the way it's done in Eretz Israel. We don't make canals, we have rainwater. You collect the rainwater, etc. cetera. It's, it's not exactly the same thing. And we're gonna see that this is actually very important. But rather, it, the, the land that you're about to go into to, to inherit it, to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys, which soaks up its waters from the rains of the heaven, which is something to do with like the aquifers, which we'll talk about um, later. So it's very different in that sense. Now, uh, before we go into the details, I would like to just give an overview of how important the Nile is in understanding Egypt and understanding their kingship, their mythology, their rulership, and the concept of the individual in front of the paro, the pharaoh, and what role the individual has in Egypt. Uh, this is gonna be very, very important. So hang on there, there's gonna be a bit of mythology and geography here. So if you've been with my previous presentations, you're already familiar with this. This is the upside down map of Egypt. And the reason it's upside down is because this is how the Egyptians actually looked at the world. So you have north, as you see on the bottom right, north is actually facing down, 
but the source of the Nile was of course from Central Africa. And so that long squiggly line, which has a lot of cataract, which is like waterfalls, uh, as it pours further down and down and down at, until it goes into the into Mediterranean Sea, that is the life force of Egypt, the source of water, the source of life. And so the society of Egypt is very much centralized around the Nile River. And in ancient times, before we had the, the infrastructure that allowed us to have uh, water drainage and, and electricity in the desert, Egypt was completely limited to the confines of the Nile, the inundation, which is the height uh, at, at its height, how high the Nile is before it then settles down and deposits all that rich mineral silt, which is then used to, uh, to use for, for growing things, which now unfortunately has, is not there anymore because of the Aswan Dam, and which is also damaging and corroding the coastlines of Israel because you don't have that mineral deposit, which would usually strengthen our coastlines all the way up to Lebanon. So it's a very important thing. Now, in Egypt, um, the, the land was divided into these two very graphic divisions. There's Upper Egypt, which as I mentioned, there's these cataracts, which are waterfalls. So it's higher up. That's called Upper Egypt. And the lower part, which is called the Nile Delta, which spills into the Mediterranean, that is called Lower Egypt. And that is the division of ancient Egypt. Another thing you need to know is that ancient Egypt was divided into 14, that's one four, 14 provinces. And all of this is gonna play an important role in the mythologies or the origin stories of Egypt, which we're looking at from a psychological perspective. We're not giving it any reality in terms of, because it's Avodah Zarah, but to understand the role, the psychological role that it played in forming a nation. So it's gonna all start with the mythology of the, of the sun god Ra and then his, and his grandson Horus. So this is, this is um, Horus, who's a falcon god. He's a sky god, so he's a bird. And you'll also notice that he's wearing a hat, which you've been in my previous presentations, you know that this is the double crown, uh, the Egyptian double crown, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, a little bit of mythology, just so we understand what we're talking about, so that we can introduce Paro. So according to the Egyptian mythology, the sun god Ra was the first god to become like the pharaoh on earth as a human, and he had a bunch of children. Two of them, Isis and Osiris, married each other, and they, had a, they, they ended up ruling the throne after Ra. So everyone was happy ever, ever after, except for, of course, one of the other children, whose name was Seth, who, Seth, who was very, very jealous of his brother Osiris for ruling the throne. And so he conspired against his brother, murdered him, and uh, tore him up, chopped him up into 14 pieces and spread him out throughout Egypt to make it impossible to resurrect him. Now, those 14 pieces throughout Egypt is basically the 14 provinces of ancient Egypt. So in this mythology, we're going to unite those to create a unified vision which brings Egypt together. And so uh, the wife and sister of Osiris, whose name is Isis, Isis was a great sorceress and had the power of resurrection. And she was able to gather all the 14 pieces together, bring Osiris, her beloved, back to life for one hour. She became pregnant and they had the child Horus. And then they went, she went to join her husband in the underworld, in the world of the dead. Now, all of that's important, first of all, because it shows us a unification of all of Egypt under, in one story. And finally, the child Horus grows up to take revenge, to avenge uh, his uncle, uh, his father's death by his uncle Set, and he kills his, his uncle Set, and he becomes the ruler of Egypt. And so he becomes the ruler of upper and lower Egypt, and also of the underworld and the world of the living, thus basically uniting upper and lower, upper and lower Egypt, upper and lower realms. And so the god Horus, which you see on your right, is basically the Egyptian concept of the unification of all of Egypt. And here is where this comes into play. Um, what you see on the left here is what's called a serich. A serich is the, is the face, the facade of a building. Now, what you're looking at is actually the name of the pharaoh Jet. Um, that little serpent inside is the, is the hieroglyph for the symbol Jet which is how you pronounce it. And what you see on top is Horus, who we just discussed, and he's sitting on top of a royal building. Now this is up until around the New Kingdom, which is like roughly the time of the Shia Buddha Mitzrayim. In other words, for over a thousand years, this has been the way the name of the Pharaoh was written. In fact, his name wasn't Pharaoh. His name was Horus. That's what he was called. Or actually Horus is the Greek pronunciation because they add the, the us, at the end, it's really Kho, which is, you know, Americans, uh, you speak English, you say Hor, but it's really Kho. So that was his name. So this is Kho Jet. This is Horus Jet. And this is how you wrote the name of the Pharaoh. Why is that important? Let's take a look back at our, 
um, at our Horus, and this is the Pharaoh. The Egyptian mythology, the Egyptian belief was that the person who was born of the royal bloodline, the Pharaoh, were descendants, of course, of Ra himself, and these people were born as a human, but when they ascended the throne, uh, they got four more names, which I'm going to mention in a moment. And basically, they are sort of gods who, when they die, they're going to come back to life as Horus in the afterlife. And so the whole point of making the pyramids and making the mummies is to preserve the body of the Pharaoh so that he has an eternal home and that he continues to rule as Horus. So I guess there's some sort of conglomerate of all the dead Pharaohs. I don't know how that works. But the point is that Pharaoh is an extension of Horus, a manifestation of Horus. And so all of that mythology comes to tell you that the Pharaoh is the uniter of upper and lower Egypt, of both lands, of all of the provinces of Egypt, and he controls the Nile. And that is why the Pharaoh has the double crown of upper and lower Egypt. Because the legendary first Pharaoh, the Pharaoh Narmer, who united upper and lower Egypt, uh, united the lower crown and the upper crown of Egypt and created this double crown. And I'm not going into too much detail about that. We've done that in the past. But here is the five names of Horus. Look again to that Stella, to that, um, to that Serech. Now, the king was without question the most important living person, and his name had to reflect his importance. So kings usually took on four royal names when they ascended to the, to the throne, in addition to their birth name. Each had a solemn title and described an aspect of the king's role. And so just as an overview to understand this, we have the Horus name, the two ladies name, not going into all of that, the golden Horus name, the king of upper and lower Egypt name, that's his throne name, and the son of Ra name, which is his birth name. Now, just as one example, I'm going to talk about Ramesses the Great because he's very famous. So his Horus name is Strong Bull, beloved of Maat. His two ladies name is Protector of Egypt and Kerber of Foreign Lands. His golden Horus name is Powerful of Years, Great of Success. And by the way, he lived to be 90-something, so that's quite impressive. His king of Upper and Lower Egypt name is Usir Ma'at Ra, which means powerful is the justice of Ra. And his born name, his son of Ra name is Ramesses, which means Ra has given birth to him. Birth to him, Ramesses. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Um, Moses like Moshe. Moses actually means to give birth to, like it's a child. So this kind of puts together the Pharaoh. Okay, so we've seen that the Pharaoh basically controls all of Egypt. And in that sense, every person in Egypt is basically a slave to Paro by his very existence because Paro is the ruler of all of that. And all the life that's given to you uh, in Egypt is thanks to Paro who by divine power is able to give you that Nile and your productivity and so on. So you're really locked into the system of looking at Paro as, as the ruler supreme. Okay, now um, the Nile itself. So this is just a nice painting from the Met. Um, since uh, I would love to visit it and it's closed and it's 150th year. So, you know, I'm, pu I'm putting in more than the archaeology, something a little bit different. It's a painting from, you know, about 100 something years ago. And what it's showing you is, is, is Sargent, was a very, Sargent is a very famous American painter. Um, and he's visited many times. And so he's, he, he actually imagined that the way the Egyptians are currently using the Nile is the way it's always been unchanged since biblical times. But anyway, it's a painting of people working in the Nile. And even now with the Aswan Dam, Egypt still has a very powerful agricultural component. Okay, so let's go back to that verse that we saw in Devarim. So look at this image for a little bit. Look what's happening in it. This is an image from a, from a, pain, from a, from a, um, a painting from a tomb. Um, I've actually been seeing lately on Facebook a lot of 3D um, um, visions, uh, visuals of uh, these tombs. You can just like move your phone around and as if you're inside, they're looking at all these amazing, amazing paintings. So you can look these up on all these ancient Egypt uh, um, groups. But anyway, so look what's happening. On the very top register, you have people gathering grains and there's this massive looking person who you only see his, his feet. That's not Gulliver. That's simply uh, how they sort of show the most important person in the picture and everybody else is kind of subservient to them. But on the bottom register, on the right-hand side, you have the person whose tomb this was overlooking uh, his, his, uh, his estate, perhaps. And you have people working the land with a plow and with bulls. You have people uh, harvesting the ground. You have people putting in grain on the left. And you have the Nile River there. And you see people sort of, you see the Nile is sort of dragged throughout. People are making holes on the left. You can see on the, on the left, you see people making holes like the, making canals to draw the water out so that you can bring it into your field. So this is the way Egyptians really worked. So I want to take another, here's another picture, which is more of like a modern one from a kid's, uh, an educational website. And here's, I want to make a small connection here to Lot and Avraham Avinu. Remember that Lot 
leaves from Avraham Avinu and, and he decides to go to Sidon. And the way that Sidon is described is with a comparison to the lush green fertility of Egypt. It says, look, looks up, kol he sees the whole Jordan Valley, kikula mashke, it's just beautiful and lush, before all the destruction, kegan Hashem, ke'eretz Mitzrayim, bo'acha tzohar. Like it's as, as if it's, you're going to, tzohar is in the eastern part of the, of the uh, Jordan River. So it's like, it's like a lush garden of Egypt on your way to Egypt. Now, a, 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 on your way to tzohar. Now, an interesting point about this is that Sodom is, rege- uh, um, not Sodom, well, Sodom as well, the re- their rejection of the chesed of Abraham Avinu was the extreme opposite of basically being self-sufficient, not being dependent on anything, and everything that you do needs to be by your own merits. And so I know this is a broader topic and I'm not going into it now, but the point of Sodom is basically like Ayn Rand, right? It's basically no no chesed, no dependency. I want to be absolutely self-sufficient. And if I rely on anybody else for tzedakah, I'm basically allowing them to control a certain part of me. And so, they had that concept of a standardized bed, mitat sodom, like if you're too long, they would chop you up. If you were too short, they would stretch you. That whole concept is to come to say to you that if you want to be dependent like everybody else, then you're not, then you may as well be stretched or chopped up because you're not unique. So like they have this concept of anti chesed. But anyway, Sodom goes there. And the whole point of Sodom is that you live on your own merits. And so the whole point of Sodom, and I'm going to compare this again to what we said about Egypt, is that in Egypt, it's everything that we said. Let me, let me, let me move to that pasuk. Okay? Um, so we're back at this pasuk. As we said, It's not like Egypt, because in Egypt, in order to succeed, you need to put in the toil and the work, and the Nile as a constant, which is constantly providing, is anyway going to work for you. And so if you don't do the work yourself, then who, who is to blame for not succeeding, right? And so this, this idea of it all need, it's all on you, you have to put in the work, is a very much like a Sodom idea as well. And that's kind of like the idea in the Nile, um, where you're constantly uh, dependent on the Nile and you have to put in the work. Okay, we're going to get back to that a little bit. Now, you're going to be coming into Eretz Israel, And Eretz Israel is an Eretz Harim Uvka'ot. It's a place of hills and valleys. You're going to be completely dependent on rainwater. And here's the interesting addition and why HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, tr- uh, has special care for Eretz Yisrael in terms of rain. How do we know that? Because it says, Eretz Asher Hashem Elokecha Doresh Ota, Tamid Ene Hashem Elokecha Ba. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God is basically interested in this land. He's looking after this land constantly, Mereshit Hashana Ve'ad Aharit Hashana, from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. And from here, the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah discusses this, that this is where we learn the concept of there being a deen, a judgment on Rosh Hashanah, which applies to the whole year. This is the, the source of it, that there is this judgment about that where Hashem is basically supplying something for a, an entire year, and it's specifically in terms of rain, which is really Gemara famously says, what if they were tzaddikim and Rosh Hashanah, but then they messed up? You can't change the ration of, of rain that's provided for that year. The question is, how does it come? Is it, does it come as a tsunami or does it come as drip irrigation, etc., etc.? So the, the relationship of a Kadosh Baruch Hu to Eretz Yisrael is specifically in terms of rainfall. And let's move on from here to where we famously see it, which is the second paragraph of the Shema. So we say this every day, twice a day. If you follow the mitzvot which Hashem gives you, so what's going to happen? You're going to have rain in the land at the proper time. And that's important. The first rain and the last rain, you're going to succeed, you're going to be fruitful, and that's all pretty much dependent on you doing the mitzvot properly, as opposed to going out and doing the work in the field, This is a, which is mitzrayim. Here, you're, you have to have a kind of morality, a kind of proper behavior, and so on and so forth. Okay. And finally, what happens if you don't do that? And this is one of many examples. We have all of, you know, Behar B'chukotai, and we have Kitavo. This is in, in Bechukotai. What's going to happen? Hashem is saying, um, everything is going to go bad for you. And finally, It's basically saying that your, your skies will be like iron and your earth like copper. Basically, you're not going to have a productive land. And it's a very fascinating thing. If you've seen, for example, The Lion King, um, Disney's Lion King, it takes for granted that when the inappropriate king is ruling the land, 
this is exactly what happens to it. Nothing is productive, nothing works. And when there's the proper king who respects the balance of nature and the way things need to be, then suddenly it rains. Like, how does, the, how does nature know what to do? But we don't really doubt that when we watch the movie as kids, because it makes sense to us. So it's very important to recognize that there's a relationship between how we behave and how the land in Eretz Yisrael functions. So that was step one. Now, in terms of Eretz Yisrael and in, 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 uh, in, um, in our dependency on water, I want to mention that the Kinneret, um, which we talk about a lot, has recently um, overflown to the point where they're talking about opening up the, the, the Ganya Dam, otherwise Tveria will be flooded. Now, that is tremendously important because if you look at this graph, you can see the, um, you can see the, uh, the, the, the uh, how high the Kinneret is supposed to be, what's considered in danger. So if you look at the bottom line, the black line, the point of the black line is that if the water, the waterbed, the, of the, the water level of the Kinneret goes below that, then there's not going to be enough water pressure on the salt waters that are coming in from below, and the whole, the whole Kinneret's going to get salinated and undrinkable. It's going to be destroyed. And so that's the point of the black line. Why you call an upper red line and a bottom red line both an emergency line is beyond me. But I grew up hearing this. How many, like, it's in the news. How many meters below or above the red line we are this year in the Kinneret? So it's really part of growing up in Eretz Israel. And I want to stress that point. So look how low it's been going. You can see the dates on the bottom. You have from the 60s, uh, there's been ups and downs, ups and downs. 2000, I sort of remember in 2002 where it was pouring rain. I was in high school and I remember driving by the Kinneret and seeing treetops coming out of the water. We just had that again now. So you can look at what was happening over the last eight years from 20. 12, uh, 12 to 2018 and until now. And then this year, Baruch Hashem, Chasdei Hashem, we've been, the, the Kinevet suddenly back up to the red line, to the upper red line, which is amazing. However, and look, this is what it looks like today. And this is actually a website where you can, on Haaretz, where I see the, 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 the link on the bottom, where you can actually drag the, the little dot on the top ruler and see what the Kinevet was like. And if you just go a few months back, it drops all the way to the bottom. So this is quite incredible to see where we're holding. This is as of last week. Um, however, um, it's a bit of a misnomer because in Eretz Yisrael, our, our water is not dependent on the Kinneret. It's actually dependent on the aquifers, which is the, wa the underground water, which is absorbed from rainwater, not from the Kinneret. And the reason that the Kinneret is not the primary water source for Israel is because we don't want to lower the water level and reach salination. And so, the, so in Eretz Yisrael, we're very much dependent on underground water. Um, so this is just something which is really relevant to us because we're talking about uh, Yom Ha'atzma'ut, and we're coming up to Yom Yerushalayim. Yom Yerushalayim, I'm sure Bava, you for sure know this. Um, and after the UN partition plan in 1947, when the UN declared there's going to be a, a Jewish state and a Palestinian state, so while the Jews rejoiced, a lot of the Arabs sur surrounded us for, in, in battle. And one of the things that happened is that around Jerusalem, uh, we, were, we were basically besieged. And so if you would try to drive on, on uh, Shal Haggai from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, you'd get shot at. And so the people in Jerusalem were putting up a fight against the Jordanian army. And for three weeks, we were under siege until we surrendered to the Jordanians. And during this time, um, the water in, in, in Jerusalem was, rash, was rationed. And so you had, would have 10 liters of water per family. Now, if you have 10 liters of water and you have to do all these different things, how do you manage your water usage? And so this chart, and here's a detailed writing of it, uh, explains to you how to manage 10 liters of water. So you see two water, liters of water for drinking. This is the amount for cooking. Now, if you use water for washing dishes, you can use it again for other things. You can use it for washing yada. You can collect the water, wash the toilet, take a shower, clean the floor. So you have a very careful distribution of the water to allow you to survive. And this is without talking about what the craziness that's going on today with people hoarding. Like this is people who really needed it, right? So this is something that's kind of associated with Eretz Yisrael and water and is associated with our time. So I thought that's a, that's a nice addition. Now, one last thing about Israel's water. These are the type of posters I saw growing up. So chaval al kol tipa, any Israeli knows this phrase, right? Like when I see, uh, so like I had a roommate in, in, in Brooklyn who would, want, who would like turn up on the sink, fill up his cup of water, drink the water, and he leaves the sink pouring with water. I'm like, I would go crazy, turn it off, you know, turn it off. Like we need water, the kinerets, and he's like, what Kinneret? We're, we're in America. <laughs> but this is ingrained in Israel, in an Israeli mindset. Here's Chasoch Bemaim, and these are all from the National Archive, um, the Zionist organization. Chasoch Bemaim, Chaval al Kol Tipa. And finally, uh, this is a very nice one. Melay Hamaim Yesh Lishmo, Hayom Bizbuz Machar Machsor. 
which is a very valid message. It's saying like, you think you can, you can use too much now, but you're not thinking about tomorrow. And, and I remember years like this when, when, you know, I remember being in Jordan in 2000 and there were certain hours of the day that you can use the water. And then there's hours that you can't use water because they're very conscious of it. Okay. So just, we're almost done, but just to conclude this little detail. So uh, this detail is that the Brit, the covenant, and the natural conditions of Eretz Yisrael require action, morality, and accountability. That's what the Shema is about. And our freedom in Eretz Yisrael, which is really our next topic, is a product of having meaningful op options and meaningful choices. And what we do matters. What, what is that all about? That's going to take us into our final part. So where does Eretz Yisrael actually show up in the, in the beginning, in the first time it actually shows up? It shows up in terms of a connection to us as the children of Abraham in the famous covenant, which is called Brit ben Habetarim, which is the covenant of the parts, where Avraham Avinu, which is, which is, by the way, a common way of making covenants in the ancient world, is taking an animal for, as an offering, you know, cutting it in half and walking between it. So it, it's a kind of, it's, it was a known thing at the time. And Avraham Avinu makes this covenant, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to him, like, he basically says, Ani Hashem Hashem Hatsuticha Me'ur Kasdim, I took you out of Ur Kasdim, which we'll get to in a moment, for the purpose of giving you this land as an inheritance, which means it's going to be hereditary to your children, which is a very complex concept. Like, what, what does giving the gift to me have to do with my children? Like, doesn't this have to do with my own achievement? What, what if they're not going to deserve it, right? What's it got to do with genetics? So I'm just going to put that on the shelf. So he answers, How will I know that I am to, be, to inherit this? Legitimate question? Sure, it's a legitimate question. Now, just in the few came previously to that, Hashem said to him that I'm going to, you're going to have many children, they're going to fill the land, and he just says, Yeah, I believe, I accept whatever HaKadosh Baruch says. No questions asked. But when you give Eretz Yisrael as a Yerusha, I'm willing to accept it as a gift, but as a Yerusha, I mean, what's, what's this got to do with it, with my children? What is this about? And this is where we are promised Eretz Yisrael. And so here we have the famous, uh, the famous saying, Vayomar Hashem Le'Avram Yadoa you saw the question, Bama'eda? The answer is, Yadoa How are you going to come to understand this? They will be strangers in a strange land. So the way you're going to be able to know the answer to this question is by seeing that your children are going to be slaves or strangers in a strange land. They're going to be slaves there, and they're going to manage to get out of there free. Somehow, that's an answer. Now, it's a very complex idea, but I want to sort of distill it in a very, to its bare bones for this conversation. And so let's talk about uh, when we connect these two stories of Eretz Yisrael and uh, leaving Egypt and the promise to Abraham Avinu. So in Haggadah Shel Pesach, we just had this, right? Haggadah Shel Pesach is constructed according to the Mishnah and the Gemara and Pesachim along two versions of telling the story. One talks about Abraham Avinu as an idolater in Oved Avodah Zarah who then comes, and now we have the Torah. And the other version is, we're slaves to Torah. So we have these two stories. So let's look at the first one. The first one, you probably recognize the famous Zigurat, which is, I put it deliberately to contrast with the pyramids, even though the Jews have nothing to do with the pyramids, but it's just a fun visual contrast. The Zigurat was the religious, cultic, societal, political center of Ur Kasdim. This was found in Ur um, in the 1920s, 30s. And uh, this is a ziggurat. It's like the center of the city. And it centers everybody around this idea that everybody has to follow and believe in. And Avraham Avinu challenges these things by asking questions, which is a major part of Agadash al Pesach, about getting kids, doing anything you can to get kids to ask questions, right? And so we connect to Avraham Avinu's story, Avraham's roots. Uh, uh, we just mentioned Avraham was told, Ani Hashem 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 Ur Kasdim. I took you out of this place. This is part of a plan, and it has to do with Eretz Yisrael. And this is what we're trying to explore. So, this is Avraham Avinu. He's in Ur Kasdim. And now let's talk about Avadim Ainu Leporah, Mitzrayim. We were slaves in Egypt. Now, Avraham Avinu's struggle in Ur Kasdim was very different than our struggle in Mitzrayim. Avraham Avinu's struggle in Ur Kasdim was one of asking questions and having societal pressure, trying to shut him up, and he wants to ask and inquire and inquire and have basically free speech, right? To be able to, yeah, the Second Amendment, right? Free, uh, free um, First Amendment, my, my bad. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was funny. Um, but you come into Egypt, 
So, you know, this is when you come to Egypt, you're, there's nobody telling you what to think. I mean, because I'll tell us that we basically kept our sort of ethnic uh, character. So what was the problem? Our problem was that we were physically in bondage. We couldn't do what we wanted to do. And so I'd like to summarize this in order to get to our conclusion. So Avraham Avinu is an Ur Kasdim. Avraham Avinu is a person who he, he asks Bama Eda, and what is his achievement? His achievement is freedom. I am free to choose. That is a freedom of the mind. Now, Avraham Avinu's achievement gave him the gift of Eretz Yisrael by Hashem telling him, this is your children are going to have this. But how do my children have anything to do with my uh, mental, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, achievements? That's more like he has his students, he has his followers, and Nefesh Hashem Asur B'charan. Those people should have this connection to Eretz Yisrael. And Hashem tells him a surprising answer. What you have achieved is not just in your mind, it's genetic. Your children will have this character where they're going to be also people who try to ask questions and choose and be free. And the proof of that is going to be that they're going to be able to leave Egypt. And so when, Hashem, when, when Abraham asks, Bama eda, Hashem answers him, eda. How are you going to know? Because your children are going to be able to be free from a place that nobody is able to be free in. Because the very essence of Egypt and the societal structure that has Paro literally and metaphorically at the top of the pyramid, and everyone is basically a subject to Paro, like that is by definition Bet Avadim. The way the country is, is built with the Nile and the Paro and all of that, it, it makes people who, are, who have a slave mentality. And your children will have it within them to be able to leave that place and be free. And so this is the end of the beginning question. Abraham asks, how will I know? And Hashem says, you'll know. Now, these are two types of freedom. You can recognize that there are different types of freedom. One is the freedom to choose. I mean, I can be free in a society to choose whatever I want, but who says that I'm choosing what I want? Maybe this is the influence of society is so powerful that what I want is actually what society decided that I need to have and that I want, as opposed to what I would, be, what I would really want. Um, in Egypt, I can choose whatever I want to do, but I'm not free to carry it out. And so that's a kind of liberty. It's called dror in the Torah, which means the ability to move anywhere, right? And so freedom and liberty are two inseparable parts. They're two sides of the coin, which complete that vision of Abraham Avinu's quest and Eretz Yisrael. And so let's summarize all of this. And in conclusion, Israel is a land of freedom and responsibility. So make it matter. Israel is a place where the concept of Eretz Yisrael shows up as a response to Avraham Avinu's in, inquiry and questioning and trying to be free and not to let society tell him how to think. And Egypt is the other side of that, which tells you you need to be able to carry out what you choose and make an impact in the world. And that is how Eretz Yisrael, you were seeing the amazing response of the land that just came alive in less than 100 years, after hundreds of years of being basically a desert wasteland, it just sprung to life and is responding to a people and who, who, who connect to it and relate to it. And so this is a very, very important, important message for us to be able to connect to Yom HaTzmaut and Yom Yerushalayim that are coming as, as something which is a time for us to really connect to our roots as people who seek and search for freedom. Um, and so I want to wish you Yom HaTzmaut Sameach. And uh, I think we're just on time. I'm going to allow some, um, some questions. If you want, let me just uh, end the screen. Hold on. Stop share. There we go. And I think you can unmute yourselves if you want to ask any questions.